Good day and welcome to HTMI podcast. I have the pleasure to have with me today Mr. Yves Givel, Human Resource Director of Hyatt International. Welcome, Mr. Givel. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here. I would like to um, concentrate this conversation today around the topic of learning mm -hmm. in organizations. Mm -hmm. And my first question would be, there is a change of concept or definition from training and development mm -hmm. into learning and mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. What is the difference? I think it's a very subtle difference between the two of them. Some people might say, well, learning, learning organizations is just a buzzword. But I think at the end, there is a difference between learning and training. And I think a lot of organizations are actually trying to move from training, which is very directive, which is very company-initiated, towards learning, which mm. is something more personal, that is maybe more employee-initiated. Mm. And I think a lot of organizations try to make that shift. Everybody wants to, a lot of organizations want to move towards um, continuous learning. Mm -hmm. And I think continuous learning is more than just providing training. Mm -hmm. It's about creating a learning environment, a, uh, a philosophy, a culture that has to be there in order to foster learning and making sure employees understand the benefit of learning, which again is much more than just mm -hmm. training. Mm -hmm. So in this whole aspect, in this, in this shift from training to learning, we can uh, also assume that the emphasis of instructor-led mm -hmm. training mm -hmm will decrease while perhaps it goes towards more self-directed development. Mm -hmm. Are you experiencing in your company uh, this shift into um, um, a training that is more designed uh, together by the trainer and mm -hmm. the manager instead of I think trainers? You, can, you, you can really see this shift in the role of a training manager. Mm. And again, we still call it training manager, but in reality, this person is becoming much more of a facilitator, of a, a learning facilitator than purely an instructor. And although I think at entry level, there still is a number of instructor-led trainings that have to take place uh, in order to set some minimal standards, uh, I think as one move forward, uh, the role of a trainer becomes much more of a coach, of a facilitator. Mm. So that shift has definitely happened. Another shift that has happened is um, we don't have that much time anymore to just call people into a training room and run a three or four hour session. And I think we have to give opportunities for people to learn at their own time and pace. Mm. And if you look at the way the new generation grows up with technology and online material, uh, iPads, they are not afraid of that anymore. I think the previous mm. generation had big difficulties even reading a newspaper online. Mm. I think today's generation, uh, online training has become a very normal way of learning. They do it in school. Uh, they do it when they come out of school. So I think there is a certain shift that, that puts the development into the hands of the learner, which then really allows them to pick the right time uh, to go through those sessions. Mm. What will never change is uh, there has to be the translation of the learning into action. And I think that will never change. Mm. There's only so much comp that I can deliver online. But if I want to measure the effectiveness of the learning, I still have to have mechanisms on the job uh, where somebody can come in and do that. Whether I, I deliver the training in the classroom or where I deliver it online, uh, I think that part still has to happen on the job as well. Mm. Now, if we... Um take up this topic of e-learning uh, a little bit further. Uh, what is your take on, on the importance of it in terms of effectiveness mm -hmm. of the learner really getting, gaining knowledge mm. through an e-learning mm. type of learning? I think e-learning is a fantastic tool if you put it in the right context. I wouldn't put e-learning out there as a tool by its own and just say, fine, you know, here are 10 e-learning courses, you have to do them. Um, but if you use e-learning in form of a blended approach to training or to mm. development, uh, I think this is where, where the power of the tool really comes out. Mm. give you an example. If I'm running a management development workshop, uh, and I, let's say I have two days available to do that, uh, and I've got 
a number of content I want to deliver. I want to do role plays. Uh, um, I want to do assessments. I want to do coaching. There's only so much I can do in those two days. Uh, so then I would say, fine, if I'm spending two days with them, let me concentrate on the things I need to be face-to-face -face with them and let me deliver the content beforehand in an e-learning mm -hmm. format. Mm -hmm. and that's what I mean with the blended approach. Mm -hmm. So if I want to run something on coaching and mentoring, I could ask them to get some content material about coaching and development, uh, which they're going to look at before. And then when they come into the session, I can build on the knowledge they have gained during the e-learning. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I would use e-learning. And you can mm -hmm. do the same for finance skills, uh, HR skills, uh, uh, whatever it is. Uh, I think it's this blended approach which makes it very powerful. Mm. In one of our previous conversations, you mentioned um, Hyatt using the competency framework mm. for diverse uh, aspects of HR. Mm. Um, do you think that this competency framework is also useful in supporting learning activities, or is there is the link of learning to the competency framework rather weak? I think we, we, we try to get away from calling it competencies because people get confused. Competence, mm -hmm. competency, whatever. We sort of try to promote the competency as successful behaviors. You know, what is it in a certain organization that makes people successful? Now, once we have an understanding that these are the success behaviors that should differentiate top performers from low performers, uh, we then try to integrate this in a number of processes. And I think the reason we do this is because we want to make sure that talent management is integrated. It starts from recruiting people. I'm going to try to recruit people who have the potential to develop in those competencies. Uh, um, I then align my performance management to those competencies. Because it's very easy. If I expect somebody to behave in a certain way, uh, I also have to measure that. Uh, and then the third point, which is very, very important, is if I measure them on this competency, I also have to give them the opportunity to develop in it. Uh, I then also have to recognize if they show those behaviors. So again, I think those competencies or those behaviors they should be integrated in whatever people process we have. Uh, so we have a certain consistency from the way somebody comes into the organization, the way they work with us, the way they grow with us, uh, the way they get trained, uh, the way they behave in a day-to-day -day behavior and all that. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think the more those, those competencies are integrated uh, and become part of your culture, the better it is. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think the essence of a competency is that they're based on your values as well. You don't just come up with competencies uh, because it's written in a book. Mm. Your competencies or those behaviors we're looking for, what they really mean is uh, these are my values uh, and this is what I expect people to do, how to live those values, and these are those behaviors. Mm. So that really goes all to better, the, 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 the values, uh, the behaviors, uh, and then really include them in every single process. Uh. Mm. So yes, uh, I, would, I would integrate them. So th there would be perhaps... Um, learning units where these behaviors are being trained mm -hmm. um, according to, uh, to, to the framework. Yeah. I mean, quite often we might not go down to the behavior itself. It might be more the behavior group or the competency itself. Mm -hmm. uh, we would make sure whatever training delivery there is, uh, we can sort of role model those mm -hmm. behaviors that we want them to, mm -hmm. to, to display. Whether it is around... Um, um, inspiring other people, or whether it's about um, uh, promoting learning and development. Uh, again, we, we really try to make sure that we can showcase this to the employees so they have an opportunity to, to learn it. Uh, mm. And also make sure that they all have a good understanding of it so they can role model it for their own employees later mm. on. Mm. There is a book by uh, Peter Senge. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're, uh, you, you know this book called The Fifth Discipline. Mm -hmm. Uh, where Peter Senge talks about uh, successful organizations and perhaps the only competitive advantage is for companies being learning organizations based mm. on these five disciplines. And if we think a little bit radically, could it be that organizations would not need any more this concept of learning and development, mm. but they can transform themselves in being learning organizations and the learning becomes automatic? Mm -hmm. Would that be a future scenario in organizations? Well, I think in Senge's mind, uh, uh, that would be the result of a learning organization. 
I think Senga's language is not easy to understand. Uh, some of it, yes, he talks about shared visions, uh, um, but I mean, there's some of, of the of the aspects he describes which are not that easy to grasp. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think overall, I would say not every organization needs to be a learning organization. He says, Senge, not only Senge, you also have a number of other writers say, because of the competitive environment, because of the pace of change, uh, organizations have to be able to adapt. In order to adapt, they have to be able to learn. And in order to learn, you have to remove the barriers to learning. Mm -hmm. And he then gives the more prescriptive way on how to do that, which is the learning organization. Mm -hmm. Whether it's Senge or it's uh, Watkins or whoever it is, uh, it's fairly prescriptive. Uh, Mm. But I think what they do not take into account fairly often is the organizational environment, uh, uh, power relationships, uh, uh, the industry. Mm -hmm. And again, I think particularly talking about the hospitality industry, creating a learning organization in the hospitality industry will look very different than in another industry. Mm. So I think my personal viewpoint is that the journey to become a learning organization is uh, a very good journey to take. I think the more learning we can foster in an organization, the more barriers to learn we can remove, the better it is. But I think in every organization, um, you have to re-educate your leadership and you might have to adjust your culture to achieve that. Mm. So I think it's, a, it's definitely a goal for many organizations, uh, but there are many successful organizations as well out there who are not moving into that direction. Mm. So I think it's very much you have to look at it organization by organization, what works, uh, what is the best approach for the organization you're in, um, whether it's becoming a learning organization or whether it's a different concept or culture that might work mm. for them. And for this little last question, if you would hire the perfect employee mm. and would allocate 10 points to this perfect employee, mm -hmm. divide it into skills and mm -hmm. attitudes, mm -hmm. How many points would you give to attitudes and how many points would you give to skills? Well, I would definitely give more for the attitude. Uh, I think there have to be certain skills there. Um, but I think, I think a lot of the skills we can teach, uh, but you have to have a, cer a certain minimum basic skill as well in order to grow. Mm -hmm. I think attitude is good. I think you need the attitude. Uh, um, and probably attitude is better for higher because it has less work for me afterwards. So, you know. so would you give eight points to attitude, two points? I, will, I probably would give seven to attitude and three, no, three to skills. So. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. Yeah. You know, you know the old saying. No. no? You hire for skills, uh, you hire for attitude. Exactly. So if you look at it like that, uh, I definitely go with the attitude. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. GL, for this conversation. My pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.